I'm going to uh, feed back on some of the questions that have been raised in the discussion about scientific communication using video because I think this is a way in which I can reveal the constraints on my own understanding. And so I want to start with the this discussion about shared objects and the related um, discussion about activity theory. Now related to the issue of shared objects is this whole business of codification and the, the very deep question that Lote raises about how communications are selected, how scientific concepts are arrived at, and clearly related to that, what the function of editorial boards are in coordinating themselves around the creation of scientific concepts which are published in papers and so on. I can understand the resistance to sociological explanations, but at the same time, I think there are political and um, social and psychological issues which can get overlooked in systems theoretical theories of communication. And I think these issues can be best addressed by thinking not about communication, but about teaching. So I want to start thinking with an example of a shared object and a teacher and a learner. In thinking about the communications between the teacher and the learner, we can imagine some kind of overlap where within that overlap they both reference a shared object and say, that's an apple. And we might say that their capacity to agree about the shared object is dependent on the closeness of that relationship and we're into the territory of Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Now, I want to criticise this and suggest an alternative way of thinking about a shared object. So we've got the same situation, person A and person B, but this time the shared object operates as a constraint on both person A and person B. And the overlap between person A and person B is an overlap of mutual constraint. Now, the shared object, the apple, is one of many, many constraints which operate on person A and person B. And these constraints differ from person A to person B. So the use of the word apple, for example, will constrain person A and person B differently. So I've suggested here that maybe person B has some historical association with apples, which is rather different from perhaps the association that person A might have. So person A says apple, person B says poison. Equally, one might be hungry and the other not, or one might have toothache, or one's enthusiasm and desire to talk about apples or eat them has more to do with one's enthusiasm and desire for the other person rather than the apple. The point is that these multiple constraints contribute to a process where A is continually modifying their model of B, and B is continually modifying their model of A. Now, in Lumen's social systems theory, there is a sense that he's articulating a dynamic where individuals are picking up all sorts of signals from each other when they communicate. So a friendly glance, a gesture, a gift. So waiting to see how the other person receives the definition of a particular situation. But fundamentally, Lumen has a very binary idea of communication, and he, he does see it as a process of reducing the contingency and expectations between people. What I want to suggest is that actually we're looking at something much more aesthetic and elastic in terms of communication between people. So, for example, you can imagine a couple who fall in love and where the exchange of apples is highly symbolic in the expression of their feelings for one another, but actually one of them doesn't really like apples at all, and it's only when they fall out that they express this. The story of the purloined letter by Edgar Allan Poe gives us a different perspective on shared objects. In the story, a letter containing embarrassing information has been stolen from the Queen by a minister. The Queen obviously wishes to conceal this information, and the minister, whose identity isn't known, threatens to reveal it and blackmails her in the process. The Queen's power is obviously relative to her ability to conceal the information in the letter, whereas the minister's power is based on his capacity to reveal the contents of the letter at any point. The investigating detective finds the letter in the possession of the minister and swaps it for an identical letter which actually reveals the minister as the perpetrator of the crime. Consequently, this shared object of the letter 
has different meanings for the different characters which transform as the story unfolds. There's a famous analysis by Jacques Lacan of these dynamics. But what this illustrates is that shared objects illuminate different aspects of human relations and the constraints that operate on individuals. So in the codification process, what we see is an emerging awareness of the contours of constraint of each other. Shared objects are illuminating of our constraints. Now you might reasonably say, well, there are objects which are clearly codifications of expectation. For example, money. Surely money constrains everybody in the same way. But actually, this doesn't appear to be the case, and you only have to play somebody at Monopoly to see that money affects people in different ways, and indeed capitalism and the distinctions it makes between people seem to rely on this. So I'm arguing that codification isn't constriction, but the demarcation of constraint. As a result of the increasing awareness of constraints, utterances are indeed selected, but the motivation behind those selections can be good or bad. A good example are that the utterances of a swindler are chosen in the deep knowledge of the constraints of the victim. I want to make the connection to teaching for a very simple and important reason, I think. In educational practice, identifying constraints isn't enough. In fact, we identify constraints, and particularly teachers identify constraints, in order to find ways of helping somebody subjected to those constraints to overcome them. Imagine a child answers a maths question like this. The teacher's question is, what's going on in the child's head? Where's the blockage? And we use all kinds of techniques and objects and activities to try and work out what's going on. And then we can find a way of helping them. Now, I think our scientific communication should also be like this. The fact that it isn't is a reflection of the technologies that we have had in the past but not a reflection of the technologies that we have now. Are we really communicating in our scientific publications? Maybe we should look with some suspicion at our practices of citation. It's a very crude indicator of how well we understand each other. Are conferences any good? As I've been doing this video, I've become aware of how I can be much more considered and open than I've ever felt within a conference presentation where, of course, there's so much pressure for getting papers out of the way that there's often very little time within the conference environment to really get to know each other and understand each other's scientific positions. But in order to be more empathic and generous, we need a communicative environment which is much higher variety. And of course, the printed academic paper is a relatively low variety communication. Conference presentations are not a lot better in that sense, although clearly the socialization possibilities at conferences at the bar at night are much better. But our technological environment today gives us the means whereby we can attempt a rich communication on a much larger scale. So this is a multi-dimensional illumination of one another's understanding which can be attempted in a scholarly environment that supports it. And there is an important question about the ways in which we measure our contribution to intellectual inquiry in this way. But then I quite like Moise's idea of uh, Uber and um, certainly the idea of really thinking differently about the way we approach intellectual communication and the way that we recognize individual contributions.